for looking at stakeholder perspectives of the Rio Grande. Um, my name is Genevieve Johnson. I am the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and we are hosting um, this webinar series as part of a partnership with the World Wildlife Found with World Wildlife Fund and the South Central Climate Science Center, as well as others um, who have provided input and providing science um, in the Rio Grande Basin, getting ready for a, a forum that we're planning on hosting in November. Um, today we are, are lucky to have Jack Friedman. He's a research scientist at the Center for Applied Social Research from the University of Oklahoma an anthropologist with experience in looking um, at a broad spectrum of different types of information and working with people in the field. Um, and he has partnered with Stephanie Palladino, also from the University of Oklahoma, um, who's an environmental anthropologist. And she has worked specifically in, in the Rio Grande in Mexico and the U.S., um, focusing on environmental problems and things that folks have in common as they relate to questions of equity and governance and sustainability. Today, um, one of the projects that they are in the process of completing is understanding how to manage scarce water during drought, um, which is all of you know is a, a great challenge in the Rio Grande Basin. Um, severe drought coupled with human development has had an impact on the quantity and quality of water. And so this presentation summarizes findings from 14 months of ethnographic field work with hundreds of stakeholders and people who manage water in the basin, um, specifically focusing on 10 sections of the basin, um, from the origins of the Rio Grande and Colorado um, down to um, the Gulf of Mexico. And the goal of this research is to gather data on how water managers um, describe their role in managing water and what constraints they work under and how they envision their end goals. Um, broadly, this, is you, this information will help inform how different human and environmental factors affect the Rio Grande um, in order to identify how management strategies and human uses of the river can be better coordinated. Um, as a reminder, we are recording the webinar for today, and as soon as we have the files processed, we'll make sure that that information is available on the Desert LCC website, um, as well as possibly the Climate Science Center website. We, I need to remind everybody to please mute your phone and or your computer, depending on how you called in. And if you have any questions, um, along the way, please feel free to enter them into the chat function, um, and we will monitor that so that you have an opportunity to uh, ask questions along the way. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jack and Stephanie. Hello, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm checking into full screen mode, and there we go. Um, so, uh, just to start with, the title is slightly different. Um, rather than stakeholders, I think I just wanted to use a broader term and just say social perspectives. Um, there are reasons for that, but I'm, I'll just dive into this rather than getting too academic about these things. Um, and I really want to begin our presentation with sort of two snapshots from our ethnographic research on water management in the real ground. Um, um, so the, the, each of these um, are what I would sort of term a, a sort of a contra slightly contrasting view of the human use of water. Um, and this first one comes from a New Mexico farmer who said, I can't tell you how many times I've been interviewed and someone's asked me, well, why would why would pecans be allowed to be planted in this great numbers and a drought and with these limited water resources? And, and my, one of my pat responses is because this isn't the Soviet Union. I mean, if people can do what they want to do. You can contrast that sort of a view with a slightly different view, which comes from a municipal water manager who we interviewed who said, and so 
we're putting out a lot of information to our customers about not using too much water. And I got a call from an elderly man in the middle of the summer. It was July, it was 95 degrees, and he said he wasn't going to turn on his swamp cooler if it was going to put us over the amount of water we should use. Um, and the swamp cooler uses something like 20 gallons of water a day, but he was thinking about the fact that we didn't have that much, and he didn't want to be the one to push us over. And I use that as an example of people here, about what they're like. And you talk to people here about what's needed, and, what's the, and that's the response we get. People who are individually concerned with their own particular small piece of our total use. Now, it would be easy to judge these two narratives on some moral ground or something like that as good or bad. But really for us, it's more important to understand where these narratives come from and what they mean for people and how they influence management behavior. So today, we'll report on some of our ethnographic findings related to the study of water managers. And I should stress at this point, we use the term water managers very broadly. And basically what we're looking at is anybody who manages a whole lot of water. What we did not do in our study is look at sort of endpoint water users um, as individuals in a city or in a town or something like this. But we did include many, uh, many farmers, agriculture folks. Anybody who's managing a lot of water is, our, is sort of our main, our main um, goal here. Um, so we're studying water managers along the length of the Rio Grande Bravo, our project which explicitly considers how human factors um, interacting with the Rio Grande impact conservation um, was guided by three core questions. So what shapes decision-making and water management practices in the sub-regions of the Rio Grande, and how do these interact with each other to help solve or create fragmentation in the basin as a whole? Two, what role does whole river thinking play in water managers' decision-making practices or ideas? And three, what flexibility or constraints do managers have in making decisions that affect sustainability and resilience of the river system? So I'll do a very short methodology um, discussion here because I want to get onto the guts of this. Um, broadly, um, our research is based on 15 months of in situ ethnographic field work in the Rio Grande Basin, and this includes in Mexico's Rio Conchas uh, Basin. Um, we directly interviewed uh, over 120 water managers from the, across the entire region, uh, um, and these included municipal managers, federal managers, irrigation districts, farmers, recreation, tribal, as well as a number of other folks. Uh, um, and instead of these, ra these were not simply us diving in and doing an interview over an hour or over a telephone. These tended to um, combine both interviews and a great deal of participant observation, which meant that we spent on average between four and eight hours, but I can tell you that at least one person on this call right now spent days and days and days with one of us. Um, so um, the, these really were deeper dives than um, a simple short interview with somebody. Um, just as a brief sort of snapshot of kind of the themes that we asked in our interviews, um, the, re the recorded interviews, you know, we asked a lot about the background information, so personal and professional, really to frame kind of where this person was coming from in the first place. Observe, uh, observed changes in the climate or what they were seeing um, throughout their, their life or their experiences um, that might address kind of the issue of stressors on the system. Local and institutional memories of drought. What do, what do folks say about such and such, uh, about drought in this area? Um, Descriptions of their work or their decision-making and changes in that work over time. And this was really a major focus of, um, of the, the, the interviews. Um, and my work, this obviously includes everything from people who are water managers to a farmer. Um, so it was that broad. And then a lot of uh, drought-specific questions. How do you know you're in a drought? Tell me, about a drought um, tell me about a specific drought you experienced, things like that. Um, our, our interviews were very open-ended, um, so we did not have a, a, a highly structured interview. Um, just from the snapshot of interviews themselves, this is kind of a, a, a graphic of um, the representation that we had. Um, so we literally hit every county um, that, that, that borders the, um, the Rio Grande. 
um, in the U.S. Um, and then we had a, a much more concentrated um, a field uh, research uh, window that we could do work in um, in the Contras. Um, and so um, had a combination of group interviews as well as individual interviews divided over sort of three um, three regions. Um, so that's sort of the background here. Um, so much of this stuff study is really driven by concerns over the impacts of and the possibilities to overcome deeply entrenched fragmentation and segmentation of the management of the river. Um, so what I'm going to describe next are things that, for those of you who do the Rio Grande, will probably appear, um, appear very familiar. Um, but these were things we really came into this project with an inductive um, set of methods. We wanted to see what people had to say about them. So even though we'll touch on general themes that you're familiar with, um, in, in many ways, how we approach this and how we gather data uh, might uh, is it, it was really bottom up rather than top down. Um, so um, we talk about five different types of fragmentation here that that emerged really in our work. Um, and the first and probably the most obvious one is um, is uh, what we term hydrological fragmentation. Um, and to be perfectly honest, and again, I, I saw that he's on this call. Um, you know, we we were heavily influenced by the term hydrological resets or resetting of the hydrology, um, which we we borrowed um, from from Jack Schmidt um, because it's a wonderful way of describing this, and also is a way that I think a lot of other people who we talked. To, uh, um, described it, but this is really the idea that it's pretty much impossible to do the hydrology of the Rio Grande um, without looking at every single impoundment on the river, causing you to reset how you're approaching um, that hydrological modeling or hydrological studies. Um, and so this is a snapshot of obviously the major dams that are impacting um, the river. And there's a number of other things that we could have included here in terms of diversions, um, things like that. But um, just to give a sense of how broken up this river can seem at times, um, this, this is a sort of a nice snapshot of, um, of the major dams. Uh, um, but why would we go over this old ground um, which any hydrologist knows who have, who's, who's studied this region, um, except for the fact that um, really from a social standpoint, it had a great deal of importance for us. And really what it came down to is we heard over and over again from everybody across the river, these, this narrative about the two Rio Grandes argument. Um, and this is um, just one snapshot um, that we heard. Uh, so somebody who, um, says, we have a great deal of interest in Colorado because that's the source of our water. But really, with the compacts and the treaties and the obligations, really we don't think of it as, as, a, as a unified whole. It's really not. It's separate individual management areas with various requirements to deliver a certain amount of water to the next downstream. Really, there's two Rio Grandes. And for this person, it's North Rio Grande that ends at Fort Quitman and South Rio Grande starting up after, south of that. Um, the person ends this story, though, in a nice way when he says that um, we've taken a tour all the way to the very headwaters of the Rio Grande, the very summit, the very swale at the very top where the, the Rio Grande actually begins. That there was actually snow there. It was the middle of summer, and it was melting, and it was trickling down the hill. We all spat in it and wished Texas well. So this is from a New Mexico water manager. I, I certainly hope that um, if you all had your, your microphones on right now, you'd be laughing. Um, because this actually leads nicely into sort of the second obvious um, fragmentation, which is a political or jurisprudential fragmentation with eight state borders, one international border having to deal with state law, state water laws um, that are different, interstate water agreements that are different international water agreements that are different, um, all of which we saw represented in multiple ways, but one of the most obvious ways um, was a series of cascading animosities. Um, 
And again, for those of you who study the region, you see, you see this every day. Colorado complains about New Mexico. They have to deliver all this water to New Mexico. Mexico New Mexico complains about Texas. Southern Texas complains about Mexico and the U.S. federal government a great deal um, that they're not getting their fair share of water. Um, and so this is a snapshot from one of our interviews uh, from the lower Rio Grande Valley. So this is the South Texas region. Um, where he says, I tell you that what's disheartening for the valley is that they lean towards the Mexico side more than us. It's like I said, the federal government right now works against us. They're, they don't even, they don't ever take our sides. Mexico has all of these 20 dams up there and they're holding all of their water for these huge ag deals they put in. They, you know, there's a whole new area of agriculture in the Rio Conchos in Mexico. All of this has been done in the last 20, 30 years and these dams have all been put in. And so they hold all of that water and they're, they won't treat us as a user on the downside. Um, we heard similar things though, I don't think quite as, um, as, um, as contentious on the, um, on, from the Contras Basin, um, where we heard from a lot of the people who we were interviewing that they certainly feel um, pressured by treaty obligations with the U.S., but often they're also feeling just as much pressure from other Mexican states in order, in, in terms of um, supplying water. Um, the response, though, often was slightly different than what we were hearing on the U.S. side. Irrigators believed that they should be compensated for lost crops due to water curtailments or to get more government in, uh, investment in efficiency. Um, on both sides of the border, though, I can say that pretty much everybody was saying that they wanted to, more effective monitoring and enforcement of water diversions by irrigators um, because to a great extent, everybody believes that this would relieve pressures during droughts, um, despite obviously the logistical and the political implications and difficulties connected to this. Um, a third uh, part of this uh, story that we're telling is one that it's not, it's less about fragmentation and more just about the segmentation of management challenges. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail with this, but uh, in essence, if we imagine um, that one of our goals is to try and think the whole river, um, it becomes particularly difficult when um, thinking through uh, natural resource management um, or uh, managing for for, for instance, um, endangered or threatened ecosystems or species, um, especially when looking across such a, a, a dramatically diverse um, cluster of ecoregions um, in, the, in the Rio Grande uh, basin broadly. Um, you can imagine the management challenges that folks would face if they did have to put together a cluster of useful policies that dealt with this that whole system. Um, and yet, at the same time, there obviously are some things that are prompting specific, often sub-basin um, responses. Um, the, the, the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow um, has, has led to significant um, responses in certain regions of the river. Um, so I show this picture up here in the, the top left that is of a water gauge in the uh, stream gauge in the in the center of uh, Albuquerque um, that's used to monitor flow at that spot. Um, and um, Albu the folks in Albuquerque who I talked to um, tended to stress that this was one of the one of the added values for this was that it was providing environmental flow even though that's never mandated um, in anything that Albuquerque does, something that we'll discuss in a minute. Um, so um, the, the sort of fourth idea about fragmentation that we've, um, that's emerged out of our research is really sort of fragmentation in terms of human use of the, of the river itself. Um, agriculture, if it's not on the table for thinking about solving problems, um, it, it won't actually, you won't actually have a solution given that agriculture consumes between 85 and 90 percent of the water in the Rio Grande. Um, and no water is, has been formally legally set aside 
for ecosystem oriented management that there are very interesting ways in which it re it actually has been set aside. Um, and so somewhere between agriculture and um, and the environments are municipalities which consume anywhere from 10 to 15% of the water. Um, obviously, how these um, how the water is used in different places. Um, is dramatically different. Um, everything from flooding fields to irrigate crops um, to the traditional acequia systems, um, surface irrigation, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to linger here for uh, an extra second or two just so everybody can admire that bottom left picture because it is a very pretty picture. Um, and then um, sprinkler irrigation also throughout the contrast. And again, here I would uh, I would emphasize the difference in sort of technological um, in technology that's being used. Everything from wheel irrigation in the top right um, image, which is basically a 1950s irrigation um, technology, to very advanced um, drip irrigation in the, um, in the bottom right. Um, sprinkler, sorry, sprinkler irrigation, um, and um, and as I said before, the the, the sort of the role of uh, municipalities is uh, is critical, especially with the idea of growth of municipalities. Um, it's one thing in the northern parts of the river, um, but it's something that is uh, present almost every single day. Um, in discussions about uh, water and the river in um, in particular in the lower Rio Grande Valley um, where uh, municipal growth um, is, uh, is is shocking it's the, 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 the growth of population down there um, finally um, uh, when we're talking about fragmentation one of the things that emerged out of our work is what we ended up terming um, cognitive fragmentation. And here really what we're talking about is kind of how people do or don't think about the, the, the region. Um, I, I've sort of termed this compact cognition in the sense that um, people will break up the way that they look at the world or the way that they think that they can do things in the world based on treaties, on compacts, on rules, on the law of the land. Um, but also it has a double meaning in that compact means it's smaller and it's a sub um, sort of a, 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 a small example of something larger. Um, and and um, as such, one of the things we noticed was that there really is little significant occurrence of whole river thinking in actual real world management practice. Now that is different than what we will talk about later on. Um, and I just wanna stress that it's real world management practice. Um, I, so I always like to do this very briefly um, for those of you who maybe don't know the Rio Grande super well. Um, I, I think it's a, a fun little exercise, um, which is to ask a simple question. If you look at this map, where is the upper Rio Grande? Where's the middle Rio Grande? Where's the lower Rio Grande? Um, and so I will show a few pictures. Um, and the question is, is the lower Rio Grande study is a thing. Where is that lower Rio Grande study on this map? Well, of course, the lower Rio Grande study is there. Um, of course, the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District is here, a little closer to the middle, but it really is the middle of New Mexico. And the upper Rio Grande loop, I assume you all know that it's, it's going to be in um, in, in Colorado somewhere, and it's of course there. Um, and all of this is just so a little bit lighthearted, but at the same time, it drives home the fact that the contacts and the sort of geographical space and what's considered local often ends up defining how people think about the river. Um, so this idea of compact cognition, um, we defined as describing a way of thinking about water problem solutions and dynamics defined by the confines of the formal rules set by interstate and international compacts that set the requirements for water releases from one geographical and or political region to another. Um, how does this affect uh, water managers themselves? 
for the most part, um, managers expressed it. They didn't think that their capacity, or they thought that their capacity to make free thinking decisions was highly constrained by um, these rules that they worked in. Managers believed that the obligation to maximize consumption or beneficial use of water, which leads to a peculiar way of seeing problems in managing resources shaped by a number of tensions, include water rights, um, narratives about zero-sum competition. So if I don't use it to maximize production, someone else will, and their success will lead to my loss. Use it or lose it narratives. If we use less than, than we have the right to, we might lose our right to it in the future. Feast or famine narratives. If we don't use it all, whether efficiently or not, during the times when we get water, then we might fail during times when we're facing a drought or reduced water availability. And of course, as we saw earlier, the two rivers argument ultimately is a, uh, is a good example of how people make sense of hydrology in this case um, and say things like, I don't have to worry about the whole Rio Grande too far south because it dries up in the middle. It's really two rivers. So implications and conclusions of our study. Um, while we've talked about managers in a certain way up till now, one of the things that we, um, we noticed in our work was that common assumptions um, about managers are simply wrong. The common assumption is that managers are simply implementers of policy. Um, it, and this is often reinforced by explicit statements by the managers themselves. Um, so it is not uncommon to hear a manager say, well, I do what my job says, my job description tells me to do. Um, but the reality is far more complex, with managers often having substantial wiggle room, um, while at the same time having enough cover um, that they can deny this flexibility under normal situations. Um, and it really is that wiggle room that I think is a critical thing to identify and to think about in water management, in the real world implementation of water management. Um, however, at the same time, most water managers are fully aware of the, of the tensions that they're working in. So one municipal water manager put it this way. Unfortunately, the job that I have, which centers on conservation and preservation of the resource, ultimately feeds into my desire to have water exist just for itself, just to be there. There are times when what I'm doing for work doesn't exactly follow my own personal desire for in-stream flow, for instance. That's not something the municipality I work for works on because it's not recognized as a beneficial use. We can't give our water away for in-stream flows. That's not something that we can do. This is water owned by our customers. It's for our customers. So those issues I don't always get to work on. We heard similar tensions um, from folks in the, in the Rio Conchas region. Um, where um, many of the actors recognized concepts like ecosystem services and environmental flow and placed high value on them, but at the same time, um, they were, uh, they, uh, but at the same time, addressing these issues are not described as within official roles or institutional missions. Um, at the same time, though, we saw interesting cases where irrigation units that um, divert water directly from the river um, have an interest in restoring aspects of sort of natural ecosystems or at least natural channel flow and bank. Um, their mission is to do this to improve water flow and quality, but at the same time they acknowledged that there were sort of benefits to the ecosystem and environmental flow. Um, I think the, the one of the larger challenges though that all of these sort of hopeful things ran up against was the fact that sort of um, the, the river as an ecosystem is not within the mission or the mandate of Conagua and a lot of the, the, um, uh, the irrigation managers um, uh, were employees of or connected to Conagua. Um, so, um, but what are these uh, sort of workarounds um, and the wiggle, and what I term the wiggle room factor? Um, what are the things that we saw in our work? Um, some of them just involved somewhat frightening and unexpected things. Um, local farmers and ranchers in Colorado's uh, San Luis Valley um, were supporting these, uh, these significant river restoration projects 
in the headwaters. Um, and the way one of them put it was, the water users around her are also the environmentalists. And that's not the case everywhere. And I don't really have any advice for people because, you know, here we're, if we just explained to you what we did, I would wager that you would probably say we're an environmental organization. But our goal is to do river restoration, improve the health of the river. Our board is farmers and ranchers. Um, sort of a, a, a second example of this, this sort of working around the rules occurs with um, sort of south of Elephant Butte Dam. So, so all surface water rights below Elephant Butte Dam were appropriated for agriculture. But at the present, there are new policies that are allowing water use for environmental restoration to happen without invoking legal change of use. And they're doing this by re redefining watering of restoration plants as irrigation. So again, nothing major changed in the, in the, the say, water rights system itself, but there was this workaround. Um, finally, we saw plenty of federal level managers who sort of unofficially doing things, um, unofficially timing, for instance, required water releases from dams to maximize environmental benefits. Um, and this next quote is an example of that, where somebody said, we have to move a certain quantity of water from Reservoir 1 down to Reservoir 2 by law, so we can't get around doing that. So we're trying to do it in a way that minimizes the impact of the stream system. There's a good brown trout uh, fishery up there. So it's past recreation time, but we're trying to do it in a way that minimizes the impact of that fishery. And then X County has a power plant on Reservoir 1 that they've been working on, and they're trying to recommission it. So we're also working with them to get them the kind of flows that they need to test it. So like all these people are benefiting. Um, so we want to wrap up with just a couple of slides here um, and really kind of get back to what I think of as often the core of, of, of our project, which is, is, is whole river thinking, it, thinking about the, the, the river, um, again, from headwaters all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the headwaters in the Conchos. Um, is, is this possible? And the reality is we kind of have two not entirely incompatible, um, they're, they're very compatible um, uh, sort of findings on this. Um, and one perspective is from, from the conscious. Um, and in this case, uh, what we really see as a benefit for thinking the whole river is the fact that institutionally water management is relatively centralized, um, which some people might not think of as a good thing. But in this case, it can be very good because it can help build broader base and knowledge and integrate multiple scales and levels levels of management under one institution. And one of the interesting things that we heard also, which is sort of a side point, um, was that irrigation district heads um, you know, are required to rotate to different districts um, throughout their career. And so you get irrigation district folks who actually have a wider perspective in terms of basin, sub -basin dynamics. Um, the second point I'm going to hand off to, to Stephanie very quickly. Um, and then I'll jump back on and, uh, and we'll wrap up in a few minutes. Hi there. Um, so the second point was just um, extending that uh, since so much of water management in Mexico is under this, uh, insti this institution, the federal institution, um, but one spinoff of that is that national law man mandates that there be a basin council for all of the major rivers. And so there is one for the Rio Grande basin. And um, that is, uh, has different uh, representatives of major water users in it um, and government agencies. Um, and it is undertaking, for instance, modeling of the basin. There's an effort going on to model basin, the whole basin to guide decision making. It's a forum for coordination amongst different water user interests. And it's also engaged in actually translating national law into basin-specific regulations. So uh, in a sense, that's one potential spin-off of uh, you know, having um, this kind of uh, centralized uh, or federal agency be so involved that they're able to mandate this. Um, having said that, uh, we obviously ran into some challenges 
though, in, in terms of this whole river thinking. The reality is that local region and regional water managers express no practical reason to focus on the Rio Grande above the confluence of the contrast to the Rio Grande. Um, and there's sparse knowledge exchange within the water sectors themselves. And yet at the same time, there are some hopeful things. Um, people in the U.S., uh, Mexico border region, um, especially with, with ties to farming and to multi-generational presence in, air, in the area, um, often have much broader geographic and historical perspectives on the Rio Grande, um, including up through New Mexico and all the way down to the Gulf. And also, you know, we found a lot of hope in binational projects um, because they, they, they really have brought together a number of different um, actors on both sides and really sort of forced the issue of thinking about this, the, the river much outside of sort of local constraints. Um, on the U.S. side, um, we actually kind of saw the flip side when it came to um, water management itself, because water management is relatively decentralized and distributed among many agencies and actors, which really can reinforce overly regionalized and localized perspectives. As we heard from one Southern Colorado interviewee, we actually know more about the other rivers in our state than we do about the rest of the Rio Grande Basin. Um, having said that, though, um, interestingly enough, we heard a lot of hopeful things. Um, the interstate and binational uh, agreements, which are often viewed as being things that contribute to fragmentation, are also things that knit together basin, basin segments, so leading to the possibility of new ways of thinking about the river. Um, they're increasing initiatives um, at broader regional scales, so the sort of sub-basin sub um, efforts um, toward water management. We saw a lot of that connected to uh, groundwater and surface water management um, across a much broader, sca much broader scales. Um, networks and exchanges within and across sectors and between professional and non-professional water managers um, have been sort of a critical, um, uh, I think, strength um, that we identified um, as providing a possible uh, platform for this whole river thinking. Uh, most of our interviewees have extensive experience or knowledge of other parts of the basin that you can build on. Um, and there are some really strong networks of water people and water organizations, especially across New Mexico and Southern Colorado, but a little bit more dispersed um, in Texas. Um, um, and um, I think with that, um, I'm not sure if I'm at 30 minutes. I probably am over it. But um, we'll wrap up as our acknowledgments. Um, and um, we're happy to take questions or comentarios. Would everyone fall asleep? <laughs> Would, you should be, let's see, Sarah, did you unmute everybody so they can ask directly? Yes, I just unmuted everybody. So okay. you should be able to. Any questions? This is Alfredo Rodriguez from the Rio Conchos in Mexico. Do you listen to me? Yes, we hear you, Alfredo. Excellent. Uh, so basically, what I would like to I'd say to confirm or not that if there is a possibility for all actors to consider just one one basin as a whole, you know, as a binational whole large basin, because. You set up that question, but I am not totally, a, I'm not sure if I get it straightforward. Uh, are you asking whether, whether it's realistic even to think about? Uh -huh. That's correct, Stephen. Okay. Oh, hi. Hi there, by the way. Um, so that's in some ways a question I would turn back to. Oh, no. But I think the I don't I don't 
You know, somebody asked me a question in a presentation once, and um, where they were wondering if if, um, if we should actually be advocating, you know, government takeover of the whole thing and and, and get it back to, to work together. And, and I don't think that. I think it's just how do, how do we get those that wider perspective so we actually see how what's going on in regions and, and segments of the river actually, actually affects what's, what's going on. on. System as a whole, upstream and downstream. And I don't know if you're going to add something. I mean, that's kind of how I would respond to it. Go. So I, I would add that um, one of the challenges is precisely this question of whether or not it's revisionist. Um, it's, it's not whether or not it is, um, it, it, it's actually possible. Because of course it is actually possible. But it would require, it would require an enormous change. Um, so we're doing this mostly to see if anybody is doing this, anybody is thinking about it in these terms, um, or whether or not, um, and, and to show as empirically as we can what the problem is. And, and I think I wanted to add that. Um, Part of the goal also was to look for what are people doing that shows examples of thinking in broader terms, um, uh, not just thinking about it, but actually trying to practice in in terms of you know we talked about fragmentation as a geographic thing or how do you look at it the sort of diversity or segmentation. We talked about um, the way that uh, Political jurisdictions divide up the basin, but we also um, maybe didn't emphasize as much right now is the problem that's true in both countries that uh, different aspects of the river, different aspects of um, the river that require governance, or, um, whether it's in the uplands, in the watershed, whether it's rangelands, whether it's uh, aquatic life, or whether it's water supply or water quality, they all tend to be dispersed, distributed among lots of different agencies. And so th that's another area where we're kind of looking at how do you, you know, where does, does this, can this all come together or aspects of it come together? And so what we were seeing was many instances on what um, we referred to as sub-basin or sub-regional or, you know, segments of the river where actually what I would say are kind of baby steps or um, first steps towards um, a broader perspective where people are doing it on a, a segment or a sub-regional basis in the river. So people are doing things like there. There's more instance of initiatives where there are attempts in planning um, in ways that bring different water user sectors together. So that we found lots of instances of regional water planning. Um, uh, different the, the pipeline itself could be seen as an instance of, okay, we have to think right? that's that was one of our points and there's sort of a form there for it. Um, we also found these instances of people thinking about their subregion. It's not the best word, but they're sort of segment of the basin, if you will. Um, like how do we also bring in, how do we bring groundwater and surface water into surface water? Um, or, or groundwater. So these various attempts within regions to kind of bring some of those different water and management questions together on different levels. And I think that's really significant. Also, I, I'd mentioned just instances of people doing projects in ways that try to meet the needs of different users. So, um, you know, whether it's meeting irrigators, uh, recreation folks, and, um, you know, habitat folks needs or, you know, the, the needs of the river habitat. So to me, that's pretty significant that there are instances of that that can serve to some extent as steps towards, um, you know, learning and, um, and how do you practice on a, on a larger level. Nope. Okay. Nope. I don't know if that answers it, but I'll, I'll let someone else ask a question. Other questions? Other 
Well, Jack um, and Stephanie, I actually have one question, which I would just like to hear from you both what you think the most um, interesting mm -hmm. thing is that you discovered from talking to all of these folks, and also um, maybe if you had some recommendations for how to use this type of information moving forward. Gosh, just one interesting thing. That's can you, you can say more than really one. <laughs> um, well, for me, I think that what, it, it's less an interesting thing than an interesting region, which is the, I mean, so we knew coming into this study, if you go through a lot of the scholarship that's out there, um, just how much is written on and how much is focused on um, what basically kind of the northern parts of the Rio Grande. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really interested, I was really committed to this idea that we do the whole thing. And so I spent a lot of time down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, and it's, I think what was most interesting to me was to see just how dramatically different um, the context is down there and how so few people actually know about that region in the northern part. Um, again, it, it reinforced what I saw over and over again, which is this real kind of fragmentation of how people are thinking about the river. But um, the, the, the history down there, that way water is used to the world, um, it's the whole world um, down there. And that to me was, was one of the more surprising and interesting things. And I think I would also say um, that that the, the particular examples that we heard from a lot of folks about this wiggle room issue. Every time somebody would say something about this saying, well, you know, formally this is what I do, and they'd spend an hour telling us about all of the formal stuff that they do in their work, and then they would suddenly turn around and say, but you know, this is how we make it all, this, this, is, how, this is how I sleep at night. I sleep at night because somewhere in the work that I do, I can squeeze in this thing to make sure that there's water in a stream where I know that there are fish. Um, or to, you know, make sure that water moves its way in, a, in, in such and such a place um, that I, I really wasn't mandated to do this, but I, I, I could still do it kind of under the radar, but nobody really objected or would object to it. Mm -hmm. And those things I think were really important things to, to identify and to see any time they happened um, kind of things became a little lighter in my world um, because because all of the challenges connected to this to uh, to the Rio Grande um, can can feel a, a bit heavy at times. And I'd go with to add that um, I think uh, I guess um, these uh, experiments that are going on, um, you know, including with things like water banking or um, different ways of defining access to water, uh, you know, a lot of things that are would be familiar to folks that, are, that work in, in the basin in one way or another. I mean, I think identifying those and being able to talk, you know, point to sort of some of the experiences, you know, we may not be able to document in detail the experiences of all those, but um, to be able to point those out and um, uh, you know, point the way to these experiences so that uh, um, that kind of learning can happen, I think, is also for actual water managers, people in the trenches, that's pretty significant. So there are a lot of things we didn't mention that are that are being, you know, sort of experiments, if you will, in water management, and I think there are significant um, opportunities to, to learn. Um, and I will say that people, people, you know, people really care um, a lot. That really comes through. I think that reinforces what Jack was saying. Um, and um, that is encouraging. Uh, and um, gosh, I forgot what the second part of the point was. Um, mm. Oh, well, it'll come back after y'all go away. But uh, <laughs> when I'm driving home, uh, I can't remember. But I, I, I just think there's a lot that's going on that's that's pushing the envelope now. And, um, and it's important to look at those. Great. Thank you so much. Any other Hi, questions? Um, 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is this is Lindsay Bass from Rural Wildlife Fund. Um, I lead our corporate water stewardship work, and um, we work in the basin with um, several partners, and I was just curious in the work that you all have done, it's, it is interesting to hear that, you know, there's there are these little pockets of innovation um, happening, but kind of the fragmentation, um, this jurisdictional fragmentation, you know, leads to this opportunity to help connect the dots. Um, so that's one takeaway that's, I think, really encouraging um, from our side to get some of these innovators, um, you know, into uh, broader forums to share what they're doing. Um, but I'd also um, wanted to ask you guys whether or not in your interviews folks talked about the um, relative level of um, pain and impact they'd felt through the drought. Um, we've done some discussions on our side as well in terms of trying to understand, you know, um, given some pretty severe um, water availability situations, it seems like through um, crop insurance and the like, um, at least on the agriculture side, folks were finding ways of coping with the drought to kind of alleviate pain points. And just curious if that's something that you guys found in your interviews or if um, uh, you kind of see um, additional pain points kind of brewing um, as, you know, water demands increase and the supply situation kind of remains the same or gets more challenging. So it's kind of a big, broad question. Hope that <laughs> I hope you can go somewhere with that. But um, you know, it'll be just fascinating given all the discussions you had with all these different water managers. Um, if you got some insights into those areas. So yeah, I mean, I think that. Well, I'll start with that last one because I think it is a critical point. I mean, I think that there is a great deal of buffering. Uh, in particular in agriculture, at least on the U.S. side, uh, um, regarding drought at this point. This is something that's not unique to this study. I've been doing the same, uh, similar kinds of work um, within many agricultural communities in Oklahoma, and it's a very similar situation where the pain that people are feeling when it comes to extreme drought um, can really be uh, limited um, in, in, in the agricultural context by, uh, by the crop insurance system. Um, I have, um, you know, long discussed and thought about sort of the, the issues of sort of experiential learning that come, come out of that, given that um, there were generations and generations of farmers who did not have crop insurance and they suffered and adapted to drought um, to address drought, to respond to drought, and to prepare for drought um, in a way that may or may not be occurring to the same extent today um, because of the sort of buffering mechanisms. So it's both a good thing and a bad thing, right? Um, Long-term sustainability might be um, kind of undermined because of the nature of things like crop insurance. Um, but everybody suffers through a drought, so crop insurance is not is it's not a substitute for, you know, the income that you would have had from a, a you know, an, an actual full crop coming in. Uh, everybody suffers through that. Um, in terms of urban spaces, um, it really depends on what the infrastructure is, um, but there are, you know, many of them, again, have, have really adapted, at least on the U.S. side, um, to have an enormous amount of extra water uh, one of the quotes, because I knew I'd run over way too long in this talk, um, one of the quotes that I cut out was an extensive interview that we did with a municipal water manager talking about having bought water from, you know, bought basically land which came with water rights in an area that was very distant from that particular city. And the person said, we have no interest in taking that water because basically that land then will dry up and be completely useless. The only way we would take it is under duress, and we have to have that in our basically investment profile. Um, 
and so you know that it seems like there's a lot of the water market that's that's um, that's providing that kind of buffering for municipalities at least. And so, and I would add a few things. So um, you might not have had a chance to. It might not have been very visible in our when we gave our sample of questions, which of course there were a lot more questions we explored with people. But um, but you know one a very very key question was you know so when when drought when you experienced drought how did you have to adapt what did you have to do to get through you know and what was that like and so we tried to whether it was a farmer or uh, somebody as with a professional role as a water manager and so part of that was to find out you know what not only the effects but how do people respond what do they have available to them whether it's this sort of wiggle room or it's crop insurance or it's something else so uh, Hoping that um, in the in the you know the further products that, uh, that come out that there'll be some more exploration of that, but you know because there's technological issues, there's um, people focusing on things like there's this new movement to or recent movement to focus on soil health in agriculture, and and you know we were able to talk to some farmers that have been that have been doing that and reducing their not only water consumption, but actually improving the economics of their operation, which is what you know everyone wants. Um, and and the other thing is, I think it's very regionally uh, regionally distinct, but in some ways, but also it depends on why people are farming. So uh, in um, in northern New Mexico and parts of southern Colorado, there's a lot of farming going on. It's maybe not the major livelihood of the people, but it's very important to them in other ways. And it's very important to them to, to uh, you know, keep their water rights tied to that land. It's it's very much uh, valued as part of the social and cultural uh, fabric and historical fabric. So um, th those kinds of things also affect how people respond um, and what kind of pain they felt. You know where they how they felt the pain. Um, that's an example where people want to see, for instance, actually. A, I don't think I was anywhere where any anyone tied to the land wanted to see water rights separated from the land, um, no matter what scale. But I mean, it, the questions come up in different ways, and, the, and I think the pain is either felt or anticipated in different ways. So uh, I think it's really important to look at that, the question that you raised. Yeah, one of the uh, follow-up questions that we actually have to that question about how did you respond to it, or what did you do, or what happened to you, is we also ask, um, who suffers most? In other words, it's not just about that person who might have a very clear way of narrativizing the pain that they felt, but we all, we asked everybody, you know, what, who else suffered and how did they suffer? It was interesting to see comments then that forced people to think about their community rather than just thinking about the impacts on themselves. Um, and we often had much more um, expansive and I think sometimes more thoughtful answers to that rather than just technical answers, which could be, you know, well, we've done this and this and this to address issues of drought or prepare for or during a drought. And something just quickly to keep in mind is that um, we think of things like, um, you know, the difficulty of farming, for instance, just talking about ag use, but what also can happen is you can find um, shifts in who's farming and what kind of farming they're doing. Mm -hmm. So. You off, if, if smaller or less capitalized farmers are having a hard time, then what we what you can find uh, historically, and I think there's some evidence of it here, is the people, those that are better capitalized, that have the resources, uh, are things like buy land or or rent land, or you know, increase their land holdings, and they have the the resources to wait it through till the conditions are better, or to invest in better technology. So, uh, it, it can also just kind of shift what's going on in ways that may or may not be great criteria for what's good management. Thank you guys, it's really helpful. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour, so I just wanted to thank our presenters um, for sharing the information with us today. And um, folks, if you have additional questions or follow-up, um, please feel free to um, contact us, and, and we'll try to get you in touch with the right um, with the right people. I wanted to thank everybody again for attending the webinar today. Um, we did record it, and so we'll get that up um, on the internet for folks if, to share if you need to. 
Um, and with that, thank you again, and um, we will hope everybody has a good afternoon. Great work. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>